Okay, I'm going to try and just go through this pretty quickly here. I have to get going, um, but I should be able to give you the gist of what's going on here. Uh, we are talking about archetypal situations, so there are several of these. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. I want to start with three of these, the ritual, the task, and the initiation, because I feel like they're all pretty related. Ritual is something that sort of identifies you as belonging to a particular group so if you get baptized you are identifying yourself with a Christian tradition if you get married you're identifying yourself as committed to the person you marry for life or whatever it is that you actually promised that person um, so that religious tradition of baptism is one tradition the tradition of Marriage is another tradition. These are all rituals that mark some sort of life trait. I would put in here graduation is a ritual that marks your passage from being undereducated to being educated in some way, shape, or form, depending on the level that you graduate from. For example, a lot of people, their passage into the adult world is the graduation from high school or community college or college respectively depending on their goals so that is a ritual ceremony that delineates adolescence and adulthood uh, under the umbrella of a ritual you could have an initiation like I said you are become initiated into adult life for some people that's a job for some people that's graduation you basically have people look at you as an adult for some people that's marriage you know where like whichever comes first basically your job your graduation your marriage a lot of people look on you as an adult after that one of those events happens after you're able to earn your own money after you're able to have your own household after you're able to hold down your own responsibility for your own self so whatever marks that transition could be an initiation uh, so those are the three things there uh, a task you also perform to prove your worth like if you're a knight and you want to prove that you're a good knight and your kingdom is a good kingdom and other knights should come to be knights in your kingdom as opposed to somebody else's kingdom because hey you're where it's at then you go and do quests or if you want to be recognized as king you maybe you have to pull this sword from the stone and then people will be like oh he's king or if you're Solomon the wise and you want to prove that you're wise you go officiate a bunch of cases for people and they say oh wow that was wise you solved my legal problem thank you you know for being so wise and helping me out here so that is that those are three things um, couple other situational archetypes, the fall from grace, so if you have, or the fall for short, so like Lance Armstrong was allegedly caught using performance enhancing drugs for all of his Tour de France wins, and then as a result of that allegation, he was stripped of his titles for those respective wins, uh, so you know, you could have that sort of allegation of using performance enhancing drugs and then your reputation is tarnished until you can prove your innocence maybe by doing a task I don't know but a fall I mean the archetypal fall is of course Adam and Eve in the Jewish scripture and in the Christian New Testament both reference Adam and Eve falling from grace by eating the fruit that they were told not to eat so there's that sense of you lost something that you used to have as a result of your bad decision making or Lucifer again in the Bible in the New Testament and in the Jewish scripture in the book I forget which book it is in the Jewish scripture but he is described as having had a rebellion against God and subsequently having lost his place as one of the lead angels and is now the devil so he had this fall from a state of power and a state of glory into a state of relative badness um, 
well, or pretty much, I don't think it's even relative. He's just, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, pure evil. So, yeah, so that's a fall. Um, okay, a couple other situations that are a little less obvious. Um, death and rebirth, sunrises. Okay, sunrise is birth or rebirth. Sun gets to the noon overhead point, and then you're like, wow, um, okay, so we're at the height of our powers here. The sun is the brightest and the hottest and the most powerful it will ever be. And then when you get past noon, you get on toward evening, and the sun gets dimmer, the world gets colder, it gets darker, and then you get night, and the sun isn't there. Um, and you only see its reflection on the moon. So, kind of birth and death. A uh, year cycle also does this, like winter is death, spring is rebirth, summer is that height of life, fall is kind of the gradual decay toward death again. So, death and rebirth. Um, a lot of people use this metaphorically, like the riddle of the Sphinx, where what walked on four legs at morning and two legs at noon and three legs at night or in the evening. And the answer is man, because when you're a baby you crawl, then you learn how to walk and you reach the height of your powers, presumably, if you're able-bodied. And then you, at evening, slowly lose your capabilities and then you die. So that's that sort of thing, or Shakespeare's character who's really disillusioned with his life says this is the winter of our discontent, or now is the winter of our discontent, rather. So he uses winter as a metaphor for how he's feeling, which is really, really unhappy. So that's the cycle of death and rebirth, usually used metaphorically. Um, it could also be literal if you're looking at the whole scope of somebody's life. Uh, there is the battle between good and evil is another archetypal situation, or just a battle more generally, I would argue, does you have, usually in stories, there's a clear cut, like good or bad side, unlike in real life, where we have a lot of ambiguity and complexity and so on. Usually there's, even if it's only a slight, like, well, this side should win a little more than the other side because there's slightly less scumbag people. Even if that's the only thing you can say about the battle, there's usually a good or bad battle between good and evil. Like, in Harry Potter, like, none of the teachers were perfect moral beings or anything. But still, you kind of want them to win over Voldemort, because Voldemort is more evil than not. So that's kind of the battle between good and evil, even if one side isn't like, wow, you're just so much better and squeaky clean and everything. Then, you know, you still have battles between good and evil today in stories. Uh, so nature versus artificial world, you, you have this in, like, well, a lot of stories. Like, if you ever had a seen a movie where somebody goes to the country and suddenly they're among all these nice kind people and they were from the city and they, you know all the people in the city were mean and rude and all the people in the country are nice and will cook you dinner and invite you in for pecan pie and lemonade or sweet tea they, you know you kind of have a more natural setting or if you think like the Pocahontas movie where the you know settlers are all like artificial and all and the Native American people have learned how to live with nature and you know John Smith goes and meets Pocahontas and learns you know that these people aren't so bad and he helps the two sides or Pocahontas rather helps the two sides reconcile themselves that's kind of nature in a conflict possibly uh, nature versus mechanistic world, or again, you know, if, if I want to, like, go fracking on your land with, 
you know, for oil, and your land is this pristine, like, forest preserve, that would be, like, nature versus the mechanistic world. So, uh, unhealable wound. If I have a chronic health condition, short scenario, this is an archetypal situation. Like, if I have cancer in a movie, or I have a limp, or I have a I'm wheelchair bound, like Professor X, and I can't get out and do what I would like to do because of being limited by some disease or some physical characteristic, then I have an unhealable wound. Or it could be even a mental thing, like if every time I see a clown, I run into a corner and curl up in a ball and cry, and there's clowns everywhere all the time in my society, I have a psychological wound that won't heal, and I have to deal with that in order to function. So, you know, and I may have to go to great lengths in order to deal with my problem. Um, you know, whether that be surgery or psychotherapy or just confronting my fear or whatever, I have a situation that really takes me by the throat and is like, deal with this. Uh, unhealable wound. Um, let's see. I think we've covered most of these. There's always more um, you could fill in under different ones of these. I am about done, though. So, all that to say, hope this was helpful, and we will talk again soon. So, alright. Catch you later.